Welcome to the Learn B12 Fast podcast, the podcast where we apply the science of mastering skills faster, stories of successful people, life hacking concepts, and other cool stuff to the sport of beach volleyball. If you're someone who is serious about getting better at the sport and wouldn't mind accelerating your learning curve and career with ideas that have been previously hard to find within the beach volleyball space, you'll probably like it in here. I'm Alex, the host of the podcast as well as the creator of the bigger Learn B12 Fast project. Now, let's get started. Hey, what's up? Alex here. Welcome to the second episode of the Learn Beach Law Fast podcast. Uh, in this episode, we're going to continue listening to my conversation with John Richardson. We are talking about how to learn sports faster than, uh, well, basically normal people <laughs> or the average, uh, average athlete. Uh, John himself had a golf challenge that pretty much no one thought would be possible to accomplish, that he actually did accomplish a one-year challenge. So he learned a lot during that year and um, yeah. Hopefully you already heard the first episode, which means you already know what it's about. But here comes the second part. So basically the conversation didn't have a really natural pausing or ending point. It was sort of flowing from one topic to another, which made me have to cut episode one and it sort of in the middle of everything. So what I'll do here in episode two to make it natural is I'll just replay like a couple minutes of the end of episode one so that you get into the mood of the conversation and then you'll hear the rest of the conversation. Hope that makes sense. All right, let's get started. I mean, there, there are, there is a key thing is that, yeah, you, you can't do, there's a very finite amount of highly stressed practice that you can do in one day. You're absolutely right. You know, you just you cannot do more than a few hours of that in a day. Um, but that's why. So I used to do two two different forms, or I talk about two forms of practice that I do. Some of which was very hard practice, i.e., harder than being out in the course. And then I used to also do what I would term play practice, and that was much easier because that would be what I would talk about sometimes just messing about with the club and with the ball and sometimes using the wrong club to try and get out of a bunker or to do a lob shot with so it's a little bit like you are messing about like you would do as a child you're and just it, like playing it, around and, and you're just playing around trying things and you're just trying to just do stupid things with the ball and messing about with it and not not really measuring not measuring at all just 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 messing about with the ball and the wrong type of club. So I remember trying to use, because this is what Seve Ballesteros used to use, who was one of my heroes. And he used to try, he only had a three iron, which is a really hard club to try and get a ball out of the bunker with. And so I would just sit and practice trying to do that. But it wasn't, it was kind of play practice. It was fun. And, you know, rather than really, uh, and therefore you have this piece of hard practice that you can do that really stresses your brain and then you can do that kind of play practice afterwards which is which is just really childlike fun and i think that can be very powerful too absolutely which if if you think about it it's it's another way of practicing something that's difficult more yes. difficult than what it should be but yes. it's it's a different mentality that's right and that's and right. i really think um when I asked you before about uh, when you you said you can get in this meditative s- state of just driving over and over and over again, when I asked you if you sort of um, discover things in, your, in the movements when you do that, for me, that playfulness actually makes that discovery easier. Because I think you're the, right. The more playful you are, the, the more prone you are to do things in ways that you're not normally doing them. And it's every now and then you hit something that works that you didn't know that you could do. And then you sort of grab that insight and bring it with you into what I would call like the, the serious play. Like you actually find yes, exactly. things in your playing around that you can then bring with you into when you're actually not playing around anymore, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, totally agree, totally agree. It, uh, it's, it's basically just a, a state of doing something that has a bigger possibility for you to have new insights and realize things. That's right. That's right. And also what it does as well is it allows you to actually extend the time that you practice. And, it, you know, because it's quite good fun, 
it makes it easier then for you to view the whole practice piece as fun rather than just this ordeal that you're trying to put yourself through. Because if you are, whether it's a one year challenge or a kind of an 11 year challenge, you still, you know, if it, if it stops being fun, you know, uh-huh. you're, you're, you're not going to see it through. You know, you're eventually going to you're eventually going to persuade yourself out of it. And I mean, I don't, I'm sure you follow the guy. There's a guy in the States called Dan, somebody or other who did the thing called the Dan Planet. Did you did you come ever come across him? No. Uh, no, and I have tried, written it down tried. somewhere that I should, but but I haven't looked into him. Dan yeah, there, the Plan, there are two right? Things. What he did, he was, a, he, he was a he was a what did you say? Sorry, Dan the Plan or something like that. Yeah, the Dan Plan, the, the Dan yeah. Plan. Yeah, and he he was he was uh, I don't know mid twenties, um, and he was a photographer and he was kind of a bit bored of his life. And he read the whole Ericsson 10,000 hours theory and thought, let's apply this. He had never picked up a golf club. And he 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 wanted to try and see whether in 10,000 hours he could become a professional golfer. He could play on the PGA Tour. And it was kind of fascinating. Um, and he, 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 he did about six or 7,000 hours. I mean, he gave up everything. Um, <laughs> But you, you, and and ultimately there were a couple of things happened from my perspective. Uh, I did have some contact with him during the during the process, but he, it's like you saw the joy seeking out, you know, seeping out of it after that period of time as well, you know. Um, and 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 secondly, then he hurt his back, so I think you know he, he probably wasn't capable of continuing with it. But you could just sort of tell from his posts that there wasn't so much joy in it, you know, after a period of time. And I think if you then decide to devote your whole life, you know, or 10 years of your, I don't know, five years, say, of your life to something like that, you know, you 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 got to still, you have to enjoy the thing. You have to really, you know, or, you're, you know, what, you know, we're back to, you know, as you say, you, you only live once, so you, you know, are you going to really just do something that you don't like? Yeah, you know? <laughs> absolutely. You've got to have fun with it. Because that's that's a super good point. Because my, <clears throat> in my opinion, uh, something that one needs to consider or should consider if you try to get good at something is t- sort of the first thing to learn is to learn how to make all of the parts of the learning fun. Because yes. I actually think that there's tweaks exactly. that you can do in your mind and and tweaks that you can do to all sorts of stuff like with the process of how you practice and whatnot that just makes it more enjoyable and that's uh, i mean there's i don't have any exact research and science that says this but but i i i've read things that uh, sort of hint that way but you probably also learn better when you have you're having fun and i actually do think that you can also make the tedious the, the sort of boring dull practice that people don't like i actually think you can make even that fun as, you, as long as you just actually try. But yes. I think a lot of people just accept that it's not fun, and then it's not fun, and then, you know, that sort of stuff happens, that you actually... Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think when I talk about the that really hard practice, you know, it, it, I, I, it wasn't fun, but I got immense joy from it, if you know what I mean, because, it, because of that real mental peace. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So yeah. Fun for me is a very broad term that includes yes. a lot of different things because fun can fun for a lot of people is just laughing, but for me, yeah. fun is also that joy, that fulfillment, that sort of I'm living now kind of stuff. I. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, there's the, the other thing is that there's that huge satisfaction when you, you know, the I, I used to, you know, it's like if if you if you've had a you know, let's say you go and, and do a big practice session and it actually doesn't go very well and you come home frustrated. There's still some satisfaction in, in in having gone out there and tried, you know, and having sort of actively not sat in front of the TV with a glass of wine or you know, <laughs> yeah. five glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs> all right <classes. laughs> yeah exactly. yeah you know, of course there is fun in that but you know it's a slippery slope <laughs> yeah exactly i mean i'm sure you're aware of the growth mindset concept yeah, yeah, yeah. so the the most extreme version of, of that i've heard is from a guy I, I listen to a lot uh he says that what is it that he says you you, you do something and either you win 
or you lose. But if you lose, you learn. And, yes, exactly. and if you learn, you're also winning. Yeah. So therefore, you always win. So, yeah. so if you look at this in the most extreme way, it's enough for you to wake up in the morning and do anything. Yeah. And you're always going to win. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like the most ex extremist version of of uh, of that and and yeah, i really just love that, that. Yeah. there's yeah. always something of value you can get out of everything no matter if you lose or or it goes to hell or doesn't work or whatever yeah fully agree as fully long agree. as you just look for that lesson because i think a lot yeah. of people just don't know how to or know that you should look for it <laughs> but life just becomes so much more awesome when you when you're always like, hmm, what is this trying to teach me? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right because yeah, you know, the, if you if you if you come back to golf as a concept, you know, what people tend to do with golf sometimes is they'll have a, um, they 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 might spend thirty or forty <laughs> years <laughs> with the same fault in there, you know, <laughs> just basically playing the same game over and over again every Saturday. And I'm not massively ju judging people for that, regardless of how it might sound, you know, because if they're going out there and having fun with their friends, and that's fine, but, you know, but I, it, it, it's not for me, you know, it, I, I, I kind of want to see some form of improvement. You, you want something, you want to get something out of it. Yeah. Uh, um, and beyond just, you know, the social piece. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely do some things just for social value as well. But then there's sure. like a clear, like, it's a completely different mentality. Like, uh, I can't give you any examples, but I, I definitely done things where I'm just sort of doing it for fun, like in yeah. that sort of fun that people usually say is fun. <laughs> but I think you know, there's a point that you said there that I think it's really worth emphasizing, which is, which is that fact that actually, often, Often when we fail in something, you look at that and you think, yeah, that, that's a failure. And if you can twist that into your head in terms of thinking, yeah, but well, what is the actual learning from that? A, you just feel better about it. But B, you then do move forward. And sometimes I think too, far too often people are, um, are held back by failure or even the fear of failure. Uh, so I think that ability to just very rationally look at it and not get yourself upset because you've I don't know, failed at whatever it may be. If you just look at it and think, well, what's the learning? You know, I've got the rest of my life to go through. What's the learn? And even I'm talking about huge failures. You know, what's the rest? What's the failure? What's the the, the learning from that that I can use to move forward? And I'll give you an example of that. Actually, whenever I, uh, from a business perspective, when I was um, uh, when I finished university, I came back to Northern Ireland and uh, we had. Uh, I set up a sandwich business with a, with a friend of mine. It's kind of very long story short. We did very well. And by the age of 28, I had the biggest sandwich business in Ireland. By the age of 29, we'd lost everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I laughed, but it was kind of humiliating, you know, and we really, we had a proper business. And it was because of, there were lots of reasons as to why we, 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 we failed. I mean, I have a business studies degree, so it was very easy for me afterwards to sit there and really analyze what is it that we did wrong? And that became an obsession for me as well in terms of the same thing as, as, as the golf. It's like, well, what were the gaps in my knowledge that meant that we could grow this thing so fast, so well, and, 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 and get this amazing reputation? And then the whole thing collapsed. And there were several mistakes we made, mostly cash flow and bringing on a third partner and all sorts of things. But if you really analyze those, then you end up with an ability to move forward. So the first book that I wrote for that market I touched on that a lot in that book. So that big failure that I had is one of the reasons why I'm so good at consulting through to that coffee shop and cafe world. Now, I had a lot of successes after that. So it wasn't as if I just suddenly decided to become a consultant after that. You know, but we did lots. I used those mistakes that we'd made to then rebuild, you know, lots and other different types of sort of restaurant, fast food businesses that we had and then garden centers and cafes and things but that failure and the ability to sit down and analyze that really rationally and thinking what was the gap in terms of that so i always look at this in terms of i try to look at any project like this that there there's a jigsaw and you start the jigsaw you know you you started your jigsaw for your beach volleyball with you probably had a third of the pieces in place and i probably had metaphorically about a third of the pieces in place with the golf 
too. You know, I mean, we, we, it, it, the, the actual figures, there's no point in us kind of discussing mm-hmm. endlessly. But you know yeah. what I mean? There yeah. are lots of pieces there. And what you're trying to do then, it's the same thing with the business. You might know that you, you might be able to do this, that, and the other. There's a whole load of stuff you don't know how to do. And what you're trying to do is keep putting all the pieces of the jigsaw in the place so that you end up with something that could be regarded as a formula for running a, you know, fish and chip shop or, you know, a, a coffee shop or getting good at golf or getting good at any other sport or any other form of endeavor. Now, that formula may not necessarily apply for everybody, because I think that's one of the key things that I've actually learned a lot, even subsequent to the golf challenge and, and kind of the success of the book and things, is that really understanding yourself and that what I might tell you to do, that lots of people will have been telling you during your challenge, they will have been saying to you, what you must do is this, Alex. Uh-huh. And I or what you should do is this, Alex. And actually, and, and, I, and I get this a lot in business too, and I always, I, I always say, you've got to rephrase that into, one of the things that you could try is this. Uh-huh. So there's, A, there are two sides to this, one of which is trying to fill out the jigsaw for the business or personal um, ambition you have or the sporting challenge that you're trying to do, but also being very aware that your jigsaw will be different to mine. But if you could, but they will often be, you know, three quarters the same. And that's, that's really what we're after. So there is no easy, you know, we're all governed to a very large extent by, by our genetic code. You know, we have a genetic predisposition towards all sorts of behaviors based upon our, based upon our parents. And, mm-hmm. and you know, we some of us are, you know, if you try and take the a, a classic example of that one might be to an extent, I'm very much a morning person rather than an evening person. I can't change that. That's not changing for me. But what I've got to do is really to understand myself and know that in the morning, that's where I've got to do. I, I, I break my day down. I'm enormously easily distractible person. So I, br- I, I have all sorts of things in place to bully myself <laughs> through the day uh-huh. to get stuff done. And, that's and and that's about me understanding myself, you know, and, and I think so. Therefore, the, the the two things are very important. If you're going to try and do anything like this really deep down and it's kind of you've got to sit there in a quiet room and really look at yourself and think, you know, I'm suddenly not going to be able to turn into this. I don't know, Tony Robbins type of character. Do you know what I mean? Who can <laughs> be, be on be on, you know, be on form, you know, and survive in four hours of sleep a night and all that sort of stuff that he does. You know what I mean? Or, or Sam, I, I can't turn myself into Tiger Woods. You mm-hmm. know, I can't, you know, um, I mean, there are plenty of people out there who would say that because of his behaviors, I certainly shouldn't want to turn myself into Tiger Woods. But you know what I mean? It's like you, you can't, you've got to think, well, what, what is it that I can do with what I've got? You know, how much can I push myself and how much can I uh, kind of really start to understand myself? Yeah. I mean, we're all very complex systems and, uh, uh, it's it's not only sport wise and body wise and and genetics it's also what do we do for for a living how what does our days look like also, there's so many variables sure <laughs> exactly. really and it's um if i'm not going to go as far as that but but i think the coaching role which i'm doing more and more is is so interesting because yeah. i'm actually trying to Basically, the higher level players I coach, the more my coaching style becomes, I still have opinions, I still have ideas, but they become more sort of suggestions that we then work with yes. together with the player. Because the, I, I know that yes. the player knows themselves better than I know them uh, in in many ways. No, I, I might know their game better than they do, maybe, or at least parts of it, the things I can see, but there's still going to be so many things about their lives that they're going to know better than me. Sure. And if I just take over and say that this is how we're doing it, there's a big, huge chance that I'm missing out something that's very crucial and important for yeah. the success of that player learning something. Yeah, that's uh, fascinating. Because you're effectively, we're effectively saying the same thing. And I think, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The longer you do it, the more you realize it's that, that there is this purely prescriptive way of, of, of improving or whatever. You know, if you don't really deeply understand or, um, or, or work with that person or understand what the, the way, it's a little bit like the, the, the Nike just do it thing. 
has always frustrated me. You know, I, I understand <laughs> that the principle is fine, but it's like you know, so part of me always just goes, yeah, well, yeah, okay, that's brilliant, sounds great, just do it. But nobody <laughs> does, you know. <laughs> if you tell me just to do it, I mean, there's there's all sorts of nonsense going on in my head. I'll actively kick back against that. Some people can might work with that, but you understand what I'm saying? It's like an example of 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 that sort of you know, just do it is nonsense. It's like, well, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you know because you know we've got all this nonsense going on in our head from our childhood and so it's about well okay well how can we get you to do it how can we get you to do that piece of practice how can we huh. get you what is it what is the button we can push with you because actually people are sometimes of course the classic example is that i talked about towards motivation and away from motivation some of us are much more motivated towards some of us can look at a goal and just go for that and not need the away from you know uh -huh. the, as I would term it, the twisting of the knife. And some of us actually will be much more liable to get off our fat arses <laughs> because they, they want, we want to move away from something rather than just... Now, it's much more, I think, going down that route to an extent, it's much more healthy to be a person that can just see it towards goal and go for that. But sometimes I remember thinking when I was when I was twisting the knife in terms of because the twisting the knife for me was making sure that all those people who told me that it wasn't possible in the early days that I would not be able to have them say I told you so so therefore part of the reason why I was going to the range getting off the sofa at seven o'clock at night to go to the range again and maybe I'd been there at lunchtime was because I was trying to move away from that so therefore you, you, you know you, you can tie yourself up in knots and you can look in in a situation like that and think, well, that's not very healthy, actually. You know, it's not a very healthy way to think. But sometimes all that matters is that you get off the sofa. Uh huh. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of had about three points there, but hopefully you grasped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I seem uh, to be obsessed with sofas tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> and that's men good. in underpants. Yeah, <clears throat> that's something about me. <laughs> uh, uh, what did you say? <laughs> I said, I seem to be obsessed with sofas and men in underpants. I, I, that, <laughs> there'll be somebody analyzing this and thinking there's something wrong with that. Fella. Well, we all have our, <laughs> we all our, like our basic, yeah, wherever we are. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Darker yeah I, I had a small insight. I, I won't talk too much about it, but just to mention it. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of on off topic, but. For me, this complexity of guiding someone to get better at something, and because it is so complex, and because every person is a build up of their lives and and all sorts of circumstances, it makes coaching for me unlimited in depth. Yes. And and I love getting better at stuff, and therefore coaching never gets boring for me. Like it's it's so interesting because every single time I coach, and especially when I coach with this sort of um, collaboration with the player, I always learn so many things. Yes, <laughs> and it's just amazing. So, and I think a part of um, I also sort of use the same concept in in the sport because I do think that a sport also is like unlimited in depth. You you can really you can zoom in at parts and get even better at, of course, at smaller increments, but you can get better at something always. And therefore, there's, you know, it just brings a type of peace because you know that you will never fin get to the finish line. And if you're someone that thrives on, on progress and, and new insights and learning stuff, then you know that you will never be bored. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. And, and that whole... Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, that whole principle about sort of, you know, enjoying the journey, I think it's really, really important. You know, that final destination piece is slightly odd. I and mean, what I felt when I finished my challenge was it was relief rather than joy, you know, because the pressure had been immense in the last few weeks. So I think that if, if you, the, 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 you, you need to try and take joy out of learning, you know, I think I, I think one of the, the, the it's something that I've thought about a lot since I finished the challenge as well. And I think about, you know, anything like this is it's like it, at school, you almost that whole learning process is, you know, you see it as being um, you see it as being no fun most of the time. Absolutely. <laughs> Whereas actually, as an adult, you know, 
yeah, I mean, my, my partner would say this. She would say this. Like, what she would love to do is just go back to university and study something completely new. You crave that ability to, you know, just learn. We're, not all of us, obviously, but I think it's like, therefore, there's, there is real joy in just learning, even if, even if you're not getting much better. Just that sort of constant picking at it, reading the book, watching another video, finding another, you know, listening to a podcast, finding that new information. There's something fascinating about that. There is. There is. There's something... There's some sort of natural, probably some sort of need in our brain to just evolve all the time. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm I think guessing. one of the, I think one of the well, one of the problems with that, though, is to an extent, is often because there's so much information out there at mm -hmm. the moment, and there probably always is going to be now. But because there are so many channels, so much you can get, you don't. We're not back in the day where you just go to the library and pick up two or three books and read the books because you are bombarded by podcasts and YouTube and Facebook lives and, you know, longer Instagram posts and just long blog articles. Just this, you know, you know, endless Netflix documentaries, the amount of information you can get on any subject, whether it's business or sport or or, or even or even self-improvement. You could go from, you know, Tony Robbins, as I were to begin with, and go through 17 other you know, personal development gurus after that. Uh -huh. But because there's so much information, I think often people are trapped then without actually taking the action. They move from one guru to another. They move, you know, they don't get started. I think we have this, we've too much information now that then holds people back. Um, and which why it comes back to, you know, that, that where do you start? Where's the click to make you actually commit to making this improvement, you know, whether it's, you know, self-improvement or, or sporting or business or whatever, and just focus on, um, you know, focus on improvement as well as the learning process. I think it's quite a balance. Very easy to sit in for the evening um, and, and, and watch a lot of YouTube videos and getting better at golf, you know, and actually pick up some really good stuff, <laughs> but not hit a golf ball, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's, yeah, of course you have to learn and and apply and yeah. learn and apply and and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, I almost wanted to throw in a funny question here, which is considering you're the first uh, guest on this podcast, how do we make people actually continue listening to this, this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Very good question. I have to just hope, well, just have to hope well, I haven't offended enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna competing be competing against uh, Tony Robbins and and everything. Well, this is it, yeah. <laughs> you know, I I, I I think I think the, the the interesting thing is, and I think this is where you and I both share that this this kind of uh, thing, this, this similar mindset is, it's that investigation into what it is that actually happens to help people improve. I think if you are of that mindset, then you end up with you know what you're the way that you're putting this together and the way that you're talking. I think that's you know. That that's interesting rather than, you know, also the those more longer form of conversations rather than it being entirely prescriptive. I think you get a lot out of that, too. That's, I'm not saying that, you know, a more prescriptive podcast is necessarily a bad thing, but you probably listen to quite a lot of podcasts and, you know, they can be a bit stilted, those ones. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, <clears throat> you know, there's several reasons I wanted to start this podcast, which I don't need to talk about in length here, but. One, one is that I know how easy it is to, to consume podcasts as a yeah. sort of background, whatever in your life. But also, it is much easier to consume long form explanations in a podcast form rather yes, than right. watching a YouTube video. Because I realized I, I, I started pushing, trying to make my YouTube videos shorter and shorter because people wouldn't sit and watch a 40 minute explanation. Yeah. And, you know, and that makes complete sense. Uh, but sometimes you really need to explain two or three points and then tie them all together to actually get to the lesson. And how do you do that in a YouTube video? Well, you can use the use the video format in the YouTube video and actually explain things with images, but that's super work heavy instead. Yeah, so, sure. uh, yeah, that's that's a really good point. I hadn't actually thought about that, and I'll tell you why from a very personal perspective, because I'm in the process. Um, I run a, a Facebook group for for coffee shop owners and I, as i think i'd said to you before i, I you know, i've written three books in that marketplace for that market so there are mul multiple ways that i can get in touch with those people so you write books that's an easy one and i quite like to do that i do public speaking at trade shows and so on i like that as well i've got a big one coming up next week um and then you and then you have other ways 
to get in contact with people online, you know, blog posts, uh, podcasts, YouTube videos, Facebook lives. And I asked them in my group what way they would prefer to get the information. And most of the time they're saying, I must I need to look at the final results. But by quite a long way, they wanted video, whether it's Facebook lives or or YouTube. But actually, I think you're correct because I was going to start a podcast and I was not going to do it off the back of this. But you've made me rethink that because that ability to, to for somebody to not, you're not asking too much of them if they've got the podcast playing in the car or on a walk or whatever. Uh, and therefore you can go into more depth because, and, and of course, as you and I both know, there, you know, sometimes a, <laughs> you can't get it all into a 90 second video, you know, or that, you know, <laughs> you know that whole sort of the, 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 the live, you know, the, how short, so many of these, um, you know, YouTube videos are becoming that the, the span of how long people are prepared to watch it. Um, um, yeah, I was about to go off on a tangent on that, but I'll not. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, because what I usually say that I realize that for me, at least, it's easier to listen to a one hour podcast than watch a 15 minute YouTube video. Yeah, I, yeah exactly. exactly. Uh, but I think a lot of people don't realize that that's the case because a lot of people are maybe not used to listen to this podcast and then they think oh now it's just a one hour youtube video with no picture that sounds like the worst thing ever yeah, and right. it is if you if you don't know how to listen to podcast if you don't know that you should have the app you should listen to it in background when you go to practice or whatever <laughs> yeah. but, but but i'm i'm now trying to uh, well i want to introduce podcasting to to everyone that follows my youtube channel because i think it's a actually a crucial step into becoming a good good beach volleyball player is to use the hack of listening to this kind of stuff in the background when you For when sure. you do other stuff uh, there was something more that i forgot now anyway <laughs> uh, but yeah just basically that it is uh, yeah you can pack so much more information and as long as you just know how to do it it's actually less energy consuming to listen to podcasts yeah no you're right you're right uh, so, but, but yeah, a lot of the people are just not aware of that. Now I'm, I'm repeating myself here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, um, if, uh, if we go further, how much time do you have? We're probably only about another 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Then we should start moving towards the end here. Uh, there's okay. I want one, uh, actual, um, sort of practical thing i have millions of these questions from your books but but anyway uh you talked about putting in one of your books i think it's the first first book it, and you talked about left brain creative concept like somewhere somehow to use your left brain that unleashes your creativity which helped you with putting and i'm really curious about this because i actually think that that putting i think what you mean is is you sort of let the body do what it does best in a way and I actually think that's applicable to every single action you do in beach volleyball, pretty much. No matter if you're serve receiving or setting or or hitting, there's there's that aspect of it is there. So that's one of the more um, practical things I wanted to sort of ask you. Yeah, yeah, sure. You is is that a huge topic? <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> it, it is. The, the problem the, the problem with that one is actually I can't quite remember what I <laughs> said about putting. <laughs> Okay, shit. <laughs> yeah, because because he just mentioned it in the book, and and then he didn't uh, then he didn't explain so much. So I wasn't sure if it was something that you had played around with a lot, or if it was just a well, mentioned thing that the, you the, kind of. The, the way that I would interpret that back is that, or what I remember about that was that yeah, God, I mean putting's brutal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> putting is the hardest part of the game because. Well, all golf is weird because it's non-reactive, you know, uh, you're, it's, it's just you standing over the ball at some stage. Um, but the putting piece, I used to just, I, I used to, I mean, I did an enormous amount of visualization. So I, I used to visualize my way around the course every night um, because I predominantly played the same course, but it's the same thing with the putting. It's just trying to, it, trying to get myself to click into a mode where I can feel that I've got the putt that I can do it. So therefore, if I stand over the ball and I think it's a really tough putt, it's a really tough putt. This is a really tough putt. I think it's going to go over here. You don't let yourself go. 
you know whereas if you can get into that thing and think it's there and just sort of almost let yourself relax and just really visualize it going in really really wait until you can just hear all of i mean i mean using all your senses but from a you know just within your brain so that you just hear the ball fall into the hole that that definitely worked well for me that you know uh it, interestingly putting was always my biggest challenge um putting i only ever became a you know a good putter at best you know uh the, the, the thing that i did that, that that i only the only thing i became really good at was uh was my short game okay like you're uh, on the green like not yeah, the, the right before the putt basically yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and that's it. the only thing i became i was able to hit the ball a long way but in the latter days um in the latter days i was you know i wasn't quite as accurate as i was then about halfway through the year it's a complicated thing because you know each part of the game you know a bit like yours you know there 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 are variables within all of that you mentioned that variables piece i kind of obsessed there are variables in terms of i i break all of these down so i put i sat down once and worked out what are all of the variables of getting good at golf <laughs> <laughs> and I put it into a mind map, and, and then, yeah. So you've got, um, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find it and send it to you. Uh, <laughs> you should, uh, because but it apply, as far as I'm concerned, there are the, everything. If you can look at everything, there are a set amount of variables. You know, and that that could be could be weight loss. You know, there are very there are two there are two key variables in weight loss. You know, exercise and what you eat. You know. Uh -huh. Uh, but then there's different types of way, you know, within each of that, then you've got multiple different yeah. variables as well. So sometimes it's just a, m most of this is about controlling the variables. Yeah. Any improvement, you know, Absolutely. life Absolutely. is control. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> if you find that mind map, I want to see it. And, yeah. <laughs> and if you, I'll put it maybe in the, if, if you're okay with people seeing yeah, it, I might I, put it I'm in the show notes and stuff. To for everybody to see all the nonsense that goes on in my head. <laughs> I'm sure it's huge, but still so far from all the variables. Well, I, I tell you an interesting thing. I have another one that I'm very happy to share you as well. And it's, it, it, it's the, um, it's, it's kind of the, um, so I have got multiple variables, hundreds of variables that exist between, uh, that happen to a customer when they go into a coffee shop. So that's, that's, that's a huge variables piece. Um, and, uh, and therefore what you're trying to do is then improve that it's, it, is improve it, control those variables from a customer's perspective. And therefore people will stay long, they will spend more and they'll stay longer. Uh -huh. So there's another, then I, I looked at it as well. I, I'm actually looking for this at the same time as I talk to you. There's another one as well. I, I almost did a cycling challenge and, um, I have one of the cycling improvement variables, which I'll send to you as well, because I'm not sure where the golf one is. And it's to do, for example, there are f six core variables, equipment, bike, technique, fitness, weight loss, and mindset. And then there are sub variables within each of those. So I'll send that one to you and see if I can find the. But I also then off the back of this as well, I, I, I worked out, I tried to work out without and i don't think i'll probably write a book about it but because uh, <laughs> uh, it would be a pure personal development one but it was it's effectively the 66 there are 60 these 66 variables that i looked at in terms of success so it's a monster <laughs> so i'll send it to you as well and it, it it covers a lot of these things and one of the variables is that i talk about is uh for example controlling um controlling the controlling distractions and also controlling the stimulants that you have whether that's caffeine alcohol carbohydrate sugar you know all of these things so uh i i, I mean it's it is a monster i've got it open here in front of me so i'm happy to send that to you as well <laughs> but it's it. that's that's the obsession is it's it's about looking at it and thinking well what uh, you know, I mean, some of it won't make sense to you, but what what is it that I can, um, you know, that, what is it that, um, what are these variables that I can control? What do I need to really control? What's the most important thing? And what do I not need to really worry about so much? Yeah, uh, absolutely. To, to see what's important and what's, it's the what's less important. You know. Uh, and, and sometimes some variables help 
another variable. So there's like a strategic way which one you should pick first, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. Uh, which is another huge topic. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Yeah. Uh, did you ever read the One Thing book? Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, funny. Yeah. <laughs> What's yeah. the one thing that makes everything else easier or unnecessary? Yeah, it's funny because the interesting thing about books, I'm not sure whether you're aware of this, you cannot... Um, you cannot uh, trademark a title. So I have a book partly written called The One Thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that one came out before mine. Uh, no way. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the problem is that's been a really big book. Um, so I have had to change the title of it. I don't know to even know what the title is going to change to. But it's a management book. Um, uh, so it's, 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 it's kind of it's a separate thing. But yeah, it's a bit annoying because it's such a good title. <laughs> That is a bummer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's not a very unknown book that you're no, competing with the name of it either. No, you just look like you're copying it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, shit. Yeah, and you started writing it before the one thing yeah, came out? Yeah, it's, oh, it's interesting because I actually started writing it about 10 years ago. But the <laughs> difficulty that I have with it is that it's, 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 it's a kind of a, man it's a management book. It's a business book, but it's written uh, as fiction. It's a... Uh, it's written kind of as a business fable, business parable kind of thing. Uh huh. And right, I, I, I'm really, I was going to say I'm really good. I'm not. I know how to write nonfiction. Um, but, but writing fiction is much harder. <laughs> That's why I haven't clicked to finishing it, is the key point. <laughs> uh, so, so, what is this here to teach you? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I've got a, I've got a, well, the, the, the problem is, it's like, I, is it in a strong enough towards goal? I know that if I'm going to write another book for coffee shops, that one about across the states, I get much more out of that. So this yeah. book may be the one that I lie on my deathbed and not have written. Oh shit! <laughs> yeah. Only because I had the title stolen. Yeah, but you also have to sometimes deprioritize stuff because it's uh, exactly it's exactly that because yeah. we only have finite time. Like there's only yeah, 24 exactly. hours. Yeah, exactly. If I write or wrote all the books I wanted to write, I would be. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in a great place. <laughs> yeah, I've thought about all the projects I want to make. And when I did the calculations, it was like 400 years. So yes, exactly. <laughs> we'll see how I do in life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's funny. I should uh, start uh, respecting your time. And, sure. um, uh, but there's, um, I have like three more questions, but I won't okay. go through all of them. But the, maybe the most important one is, is there something you wish that we have, would have talked about that we didn't so far? Yeah, I, I, the, the only thing that I would say is it's ultimately for any of this, so there, there are two kind of things, um, is that in, in any challenge that we do, um, there is, we are very strongly controlled by our emotions in that. And, and we do a lot of, what I term emotional decision making off the back of that. So what, when I'm business consulting, when I was, which is what I do a lot of now, uh, or it's my job, um, and or, or whether you're trying to get better at golf or trying to get better at anything, what we do is the key thing is to move away from emotional decision making and towards data driven decisions. So you actually take a lot of the pressure off yourself if you can just think, you know, if, if you can try and turn everything into data. So whether that's running a business, what I start always with somebody is like, it's, I, I, I do what I call, you can see this in this mind map that I'll send you, for one of the first stages is what I call brutally honest thinking. And very few people do brutally honest thinking. So even golfers, when they have a score, that you ask them what their score is, you know, their regular score. Now, most of the time, that's them out playing with their, with their mates. And in many cases, they... Um, they 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 so they've got in golf terms they've got you know like a gimme after there for the putt they don't have to putt it out so a, knowing exactly what your last three scores are that's that's the initial piece of brutally honest thinking you know and no excuses or you know no trying to turn it oh it was a bad day or it was wet or whatever you start with absolute raw facts and you remove the emotion from it and think well here I am at A I'm trying to get to B I'm going to just use data along the ways and that stops sometimes a lot of the pain that you can have of um of trying to make improvement and not see it happen if you can just trust in the process and just accept the fact that it's going to take time you've got to give yourself time and you just you 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 keep moving forward you keep doing the right things uh trust in the data and eventually you'll get a breakthrough they talk about it in golf terms 
uh, a sports psychologist, a guy called Barbara Teller, talks about it as a plateau. And understanding that plateau for me was huge. So uh, the plateau is in in golf improvement is that you just keep as long as you keep practicing, you will have periods where you actually don't. That does not translate through to scores. So I had several plateaus during the year, but because I could trust in the fact that I was doing the right things, I knew I would eventually get better. It's a bit like if you're running a business to an extent, if you keep knocking doors and keep, you know, as it were, trying to sell, eventually you will get, you know, you'll either get better at it, you know, or mm-hmm. you'll knock enough that you, you know, you start to sell the thing, whatever it might be. Um, I mean, I had 83 rejections for that book before I got it out there. You know, and it was for a long period of time, it's the most successful golf book in the UK. So that understanding of just keeping going, even if you get lots of rejections and remove the emotion from it and trust in data. I think that's an enormously, an enormously important concept. That That is uh, that is a good point. Was it um, was it Tiger Woods that uh, redid his whole swing? Very late in his career, or yeah, he, he he has reworked his swing on more than one occasion. Um, Where he he has a long period from going from being a professional into actually going to a, being a no one for like a year. That's right, that's and, right. Well, he and he that. just pushes through that period without giving a shit, basically. Yeah, and and, and the other person who did that years before that was Nick Faldo. Nick Faldo was kind of, he was a very good young golfer. He came burst onto the tour and the you, you, European tour and he won a few small tournaments. And uh, and that, that that sort of makes it sound like it's it's not a big deal. It was a big deal. But he was just going to be a good golfer, you know, maybe a very good golfer. But, you know, he was, he, he with David Ledbetter, they sat down and thought, actually, this is not the right swing. You are never going to be this type of golfer that's going to win multiple majors. So he basically took more than a year in the end to, to, to create a totally new golf swing. And then he won six majors. You know, he became one of the best golfers the world has ever seen. Um, so, you know, or, 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 you know, certainly in that top sort of 20 or, you know, 20 or 30 of all time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that ability to do that is is very important. That ability to just cope and understand with that, not try and force it, you know, think, well, I've just I've got to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I'm myself into one year into <laughs> changing my arm swing. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, or sort of, sort of um, discovering ways to do it and, and uh, repracticing. And I, I have ways that I can play with with uh, other techniques, but but I'm ultimately like working towards something. And it's 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 really a it's a gamble because sure. I might not actually win from it in the end, but or I could you know, it could be the best thing ever. And um, it's sort of, um, un- it's sort scary. of new territory. So it- it's not really scary for me because it's interesting. And I yes. do have the belief, like I do believe in it, but there's so many people that are thinking I'm doing the wrong thing and they might be right. They might be right, actually. <laughs> we'll, yeah, sure. we'll see in the end. I-, I think that they will not be right in the end, but there will definitely be a lot of months where, uh, results wise they will be right and uh, but it's uh, it's sort of that I don't know I don't do data like on a paper but I sort of have this in my mind like I understand the concept and I see me moving forwards with my progress of doing what I'm doing all the time so therefore I trust the process in a way sure. and uh, I do see a light in the end of the tunnel otherwise it's it's always like how long of a tunnel do you go into? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's quite but, a long tunnel. <laughs> exactly, but it's uh, it's interesting. Sometimes life is a gamble, and sometimes, uh, yeah, especially if you do things that haven't done done, done before, then then you really don't know how how long the tunnel is. Yes, exactly. Uh, but, exactly. <laughs> but I I guess. Um, Having that data, or at least being able to see that you are moving forward, yeah, uh, which for me gives gives joy. Uh, in it, it gives like direct joy. Like I'm having fun when I'm doing my experiments, when I'm learning more. So even if I never got out on the other way, uh, on the other side of the tunnel, and I had to settle with another technique that I already know I can do, uh, then yes. I would still have had a hell of a journey. Like it would have been really fun. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's really helping me a lot uh, in 
in many ways. And I guess my challenge is now five years away from the end point. Yeah. I'm six years into this. So okay, I yeah. feel like I, I still have, I can afford, <laughs> afford running some experiments more about the basic techniques. But yeah, we'll see how this, how this ends up going. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, sure. But that's a, that's a really good point about that, about the data. You, you really use that to, to get over the plateaus. Well, yeah, yeah, I do. And it's the same thing with, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm, you know, I do a little bit of, you know, business coaching or personal coaching as well as business coaching. And, and ultimately, you know, it, it's like the scores don't lie of somebody. I mean, it could even be, you know, the scales don't lie. If you're trying to lose weight, you can say, well, you know, <laughs> you know, I did a lot of exercise, you know, or I, honestly, I didn't eat as much cake this month. But the scales will tell you the truth. You know, your blood pressure will tell you the truth. You know, your your heart rate will tell you the truth. Your cholesterol will tell you the truth. You know, the, the profit and loss of a business will tell the truth. Uh, and, and, and I just think it, it, it's really important to remove emotion and, and, and look at the data in a dispassionate way. Uh, and then, you know, and then, and, then, and then look at solutions to try and improve that. Um, but, it, but it, you know, it's not just the data, it's the removing of the emotions. It's just going, well, you know, stop blame. Don't blame people. Don't blame yourself. Just just think, well, that's where we are, you know. Uh -huh. Whatever we've done in the past, I'm going to start again. Or, you know, maybe, maybe you know, I might get, okay, yes, I stand on the scales and I'm, you know, I haven't lost any weight. Well, yeah, that's because I didn't do this, this and this. But let's not beat myself up. Let's just make sure that I do, you know, I don't know, walk, eat less. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one guy, I have a mastermind group that I'm a part of, and one guy there talked about, he had read a concept about, uh, I think it was lag data, and I don't remember yeah, the other one. Lag data, yeah. Exactly. So basically, you also have to be a little bit careful what you measure, because if you're measuring something that actually lags behind, like it makes sense that it would come afterwards, Yeah. then that might not be the best thing to measure for your confidence at, at all times. But well, of course, lead data ultimately... Is yeah, lead data is the equivalent of hitting, of getting really good scores, lots of measurement of what goes on in the range. The lag data is the score in the course. Uh huh. You no, know, it's a lead data is the amount of times you went for a run and the amount of calories that you ate. The lag data is what happens on the scales. Therefore, actually, ultimately, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's lead data that you're trying to you're trying to work with. If you're yeah. a salesman, the lead data is the amount of calls that you might make. You know, the lag data is the amount of money in your bank. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, no, it's, it's a good principle. It's, an, it's yeah. very but, th but then one, one, e even if you focus on the, on the lead uh, data, you also have to be honest about if it actually is translating to lag data because lag data is ultimately what you want. So yes. it's a complex relationship there in between. Yes, it really is. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's good to think about both and understand the relationship and understand when they work together and when they don't and etc and know what you're measuring yeah cool uh, thank you so much for for Absolute coming pleasure. on here great it's to been, finally talk <laughs> exactly it's uh, i've enjoyed this uh, a lot i hope the listeners have too um we, there's two more things, which is, uh, I think probably all of your books are worth reading. I've only read the two golf books that you wrote. Uh, for me, those were very insightful, very, very, you know, I'll need to ask you later some, uh, you're a really good writer. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Uh, 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 they were super fun good. to read. Uh, I, I, they were very insightful, but it was like a story to read. Uh, the, yeah. the first book, the, um, well, the it's actual funny story that, of that, that, that became an obsession for a period of time too. Uh, I, the second piece was, I knew that I wanted a book that people would read. So I then went through a whole process of learning about how to write in a way that people want to read. So I broke down, you know, many of the variables of that. So without getting stuck, because I do need to go fairly soon. But one yeah. of the key things was I I I I I I sort of massively studied, you know, the the 
you know the understanding of story and what people actually want to read is you know relatively short paragraphs short sentences my natural tendency is to write in longer sentences so i you know you have to try and you can't just write the thing and i had to learn how to write in a way that people wanted to read but that uh-huh. that followed a, a, a not radically dissimilar process to what happened with the um with the golf thing yeah i can imagine i can imagine yeah uh anyway the the point was that it's uh it's both a very insightful book but it's also very enjoyable uh to to read so and i found it i don't golf myself we haven't gone into it i do some disc golfing some frisbee golfing and of course i had some takeaways to that from your books but i've been able to translate a lot of the stuff from the books into beach volleyball and probably Good. somewhere in some video i've talked about some sort of concept that i learned from your book <laughs> so, okay, <well. laughs> so i actually think uh, both of your books are great for any sports basically anyone doing any sport uh yeah. no matter if it's golf or not so thank you, uh, thank yeah, you. they uh, i would recommend them to to everyone <laughs> okay uh where can people find you if they or maybe you don't want to get people finding you <laughs> no no i I'm, I'm 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 happy for people to find me you know i don't have a personal website anymore i did for a long period of time uh the 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 best way for for people to get a hold of me is, is is through my is through my private my 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 private um you know gmail address which i'm happy to give out which is t john richardson at gmail.com it's t for thomas t john richardson at gmail.com so yeah no i'm as you know i'm happy to discuss these things endlessly it fascinates me and if uh, if anybody wants to reach out i'm very happily to uh, talk to them that's amazing that's amazing nice uh, yeah uh we'll see if i if you get more emails from me maybe you will <laughs> sure yeah yeah <laughs> we'll see <Okay. laughs> Uh, I'll bother you more. Uh, no, uh, thank you so much for doing the show. It's been a pleasure Absolute for me. Pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, exciting. That was basically my first ever published uh, podcast interview. I, I hope there's going to be a, f- a bunch more of them in the future. So I hope you have gotten a lot of value and uh, really enjoyed the, these two episodes. Me, myself, I've actually already, I think it was about two weeks ago since I interviewed John, I've already taken some of his tips and ideas and applied to my own game and, and actually already had some kind of breakthrough moments. So I hope something similar can happen to you as well. I think you know the drill. If you did enjoy this episode, if it gave value to you and you would like to hear more, well, everything you can do to to help me grow this project is basically helping yourself as well because the more this project grows, the easier it becomes for me to create more of this content. So uh, you kind of know already, just uh, subscribe to everything and share to your friends. <laughs> that's, the, that's the short version. Um, I forgot to say in episode one, I have also an Instagram account that you can uh, subscribe to. And I've realized that Instagram is sort of fun because uh, I I actually have a bunch of content there, there that isn't really available anywhere else. Because what tends to happen is I, I snap a video or picture or something from my daily life or my practice or whatever. And uh, then I'm about to upload it. And then I get to the description part and I start writing what it's about. But then my nerd brain kicks in and I always, not always, but usually I end up writing sort of (laughs) some beach volleyball insights as well in the description. So I've actually heard that people do like reading my Instagram descriptions. So that could be an idea as well. Another thing is I'm new to this podcasting world. So uh, I've been figuring out how it works. Apparently you can uh, leave reviews on various podcasting sites and, and apps and whatnot. So Wherever you found this podcast, there's a chance that you might be able to leave a review. And if you could do that, if you would be (laughs) willing to do that, that would also help me a lot with growing this project. So there's like stars, five stars, of course, for this show, I guess. And (laughs) and you can write some comments like, uh, this was a really good show, whatever. You write whatever you want. Um, But yeah, that would also be amazing if uh, if you wanted to do. Other than that, in the show notes, there's going to be links to everything you can subscribe to. And there's also going to be links to John's book, books that I do really recommend reading. 
but yeah thanks for now in the next episode we are or i am going to have another conversation with um, basically the guy that has um, he hosts the beach volleyball coaching courses given in sweden so it's another uh, beach volleyball nerd for sure and we have a lot of really uh, uncommon i would say uh topics that we are talking about and it, there's some amazing insights in that as well so i hope you will join up again in in the next episode and uh, i'll see you soon all right have a good day